thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this new session of the Theme of Coffee Talks again. And today we have uh, with us uh, two speakers. In fact, there's going to be like two uh, presentations. Uh, both of them are PhD students from the University of Grenoble Alpes in France. Uh, the first talk is going to be conducted by Brian Paredes uh, about the modeling arbitrary shape. Uh, particles with the level set discrete element method, or so-called LSDM. And afterwards, uh, by Atreya Ventakesh, uh, he's going to speak about the ceramic synthetic sintering uh, at the particle at the particle length scale, in situ and post mortem analysis by synchrotron nanotomography. Um, so, uh, thank you both for participating, and please, Brian, uh, whatever you want. Whenever you want, uh, you go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hello. Uh, today, uh, the idea is to present some of the ideas of the new method that we are trying. Uh, it's called the Level Set Discovery Method. We have some experience with DM, but now from the last year, we are starting to use this method to, in order to model uh, arbitrary shape particles. Uh, first, just to have an idea of the motivation for that, is that we work with uh, with sintering. So basically, sintering is a model, is a process when you, uh, for compacting powders. And basically, you have during this process a uh, densification, a consolidation of the powder. But in parallel, because it has a, a similar uh, <coughs> A similar energy for uh, to, happen, to happen. Also, the grain, we have grain growth that most of the case uh, is avoided, no? and this is a process that made of high temperatures. So, uh, in the first years of my PhD, I was concentrated to create uh, to develop a model of grain growth because it's very common to find the literature DM models for the power of densification but not yet for the grain growth. So the idea was to create a DN model uh, to include the grain growth model and in parallel uh, simulating the densification of the powder. So uh, what basically we are doing is to uh, follow increase of density and also we have an increase of the grain size. So we are able uh, at, this part, at the particle level to simulate the grain growth that we have uh, during uh, sintering. At this, one of the most important results was that as in the end we, we are in the particle scale, so we can consider different size of the particles, so we can uh, take into account uh, a real initial size distribution. And one of the analysis that we performed was to see how you could have the same mean grain size, but with different deviation. And how it will impact on what we call the sintering curve. So we can see, uh, some is already expected that if we have a wider distribution, we will have uh, a grain growth that is happened earlier during the, during the, during the sintering process. So just to uh, uh, say that this is a, a way that we can study grain growth and sintering. But then, uh, when, uh, and, and here is, if you, you're interested, there is a, the full detail of the model uh, in this paper. And then when, when Atreya, that is the next speaker, uh, she's working with the, with the experiment part, experimental part of symphony. Um, when we see, even from the beginning, but more strong at the end, we can see that the particles are not as fierce. So we have some problem, uh, mainly high densities, to represent, to study the sintering process, considering a first. So at uh, that point, we, we started to think, what are the possibilities? And we choose to start with using the LSDN method then I, I will start showing what is the basics of this method. It's a quite new method that 
basically it uses all the dynamic behavior of classical DEM, second of Newton, or at the particle scale, the rigid body motion, but also it captures at the beginning the arbitrary shape by the level set method. And of course, is a method that it will be, it will have a higher cost computationally, but it, it will still be able to, to run uh, thousands of particles. And in literature, we can already find uh, this method used for some, uh, some applications and we want to, to develop for a uh, sintering. So what is the level set? So basically the level set function is a signed distance from a point to the surface. So we have a, we can see uh, that we have a surface where uh, it can be, we will explain later, or analytically both from experiments. So the level sets the distance function is possible to calculate. In fact, in this method, we save this, uh, this distance in a grid, and we create a grid, and then we can uh, create interpolation functions to have the distance in the whole field. And if we want, we can reconstruct and gain the, the, the function. We will see, so we can go directly uh, from, uh, we can start at A, just giving the, ah, sure. <laughs> So we can start at A here, having uh, the, the equation of the, of, of the shape, but also we can, as I will explain to you, we can directly have D from experiments. So we, can, we need just the distance from, uh, to the surface. And it's a signed distance function. And so for convention, we have minus inside and positive outside. Um, the level set, so it's starting with points. We are using, in this case, linear interpolation functions. And one important is the, uh, thing is that the level set is, uh, has its own local grid. So the idea of all this is uh, the main point is that we have what we have, what we need with the level set is just a uh, discrete distance field. That's all. It's not necessarily any other condition of a continuous function or, or any other requirement of the shape of the particle. So this uh, can help to, to have a lot of versatility to represent real shapes. And the, the first idea when, when the model was developed by Kawamoto or Yedon was to, okay, so we have the level set, the, sorry, we have, uh, we do, a, for instance, a tomography in our experiment, and then there are many algorithms that we can use to extract the level set, because it's a, it's a post-processing of the image. So we can, as I explained, is the distance to the surface, so we can extract from tomography image this level set that we will use as input, and we will perform LSDM. We have our simulation results, and then we can validate and compare with experimental results. So this is one of the main points of the, uh, of the algorithm that has this activity to represent uh, real shapes. So once that we have the, the value in, in the grid, what we need is interpolate. We use for simplicity a, a trilinear interpolation, as uh, you can see here. ABC are points, any points on, on the grid. And if we perform the, the uh, we can calculate from this function the gradient. So we have the gradient at any point of, the, of, my, of my domain. And also it's not the same in the, but in the way that I will explain later, we also need the second derivative. And for simplicity, we calculate it using central finite difference from the gradient values at different cells of, of my grid. Uh, then one important thing is to, okay, we can, if we can read uh, arbitrary shape particles, how we will calculate 
the properties of the particle. So to calculate the mass, the center of mass, the inertia, all is based in the heavy side function. The idea is that we will use, that we will perform a sum of all the grid points, and we will, uh, how we perform it? Because first, we will create a heavy side function that basically, either if it's zero outside the point and one inside the point. Okay, here is the different, the, the, because we will use the minus uh, heavy side. It's basically that. So inside one, outside zero, and uh, uh, to have a smooth transition, we create, uh, we add this function very near to the surface. So uh, remember that in the surface, the distance is zero. So once that I have my heavy side function, we can calculate all the properties. So starting for the mass, we have we do a summatory in all of the nodes, and we just calculating directly the heavy side function. That is, I will calculate the value of I will check the value of phi. That is my level set, and multiplying by the density and the gravity, I I obtain the mass. Once I have the mass, I can calculate the center of mass. We will use here. And again, I perform a summatory, and I have my center of mass. With that, I, uh, those are the formulas for the inertia, the, uh, all the components of the tensor inertia that is using <coughs> the heavy side function again, the value of the center of mass that was just calculated. Okay, so with these uh, operations, we can calculate these uh, properties. Uh, in the next section, I will talk more in detail about the contact uh, detection. So, but in this point, just to uh, speak quickly about the contact calculations, that means we will consider that I have already a method to find if there is contact and I, I can calculate the indentations. But now, how to calculate the force? Uh, the approach that is uh, proposed in this method is to do a node to, su to surface contact algorithm okay and i have a grain a, a master and slave as we can see here but first the question is i can have for instance several points here of the particle e that is inside particle g j how to calculate the force i will sum the force i will do an average or i will consider the maximum. Even it could, at the beginning could uh, uh, seem that it's trivial, but it's, it's, it's not like this. Uh, but there is a, a recently paper that shows with a simple example that we can see here of two particles. So we are applying a displacement and calculating the force. So the first was to uh, is calculating the force by the sum, the other uh, doing a, an average, and then a maximum. What uh, with the sum, what we, was realized is that it's mesh dependent. So we have here uh, <clears throat> the time and the force and changing the number of nodes in the surface of the level set. Later I will talk more about it, but we have nodes. And then, so we see that uh, here is the DM, but not of the LSDM didn't arrive to the value. And also it depends on the mesh. Also, what we can see is with the average, the now the average is mesh independent, but it didn't converge to the DM results. But if we use the maximum, <clears throat> we converge its mesh independent and it converge to the DM values. So even if that, very simple example, but it, it uh, already gives a clue of which type of uh, uh, calculation we will perform. So, based on that, we will use uh, always the maximum. But the, ma but the maximum, it, to me, it's logical that it comes out with the DM because the DM also uses the maximum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, the, uh, it's <clears throat> illogical, but we create. In, it's not logical that the LSDM will converge to that. 
because we you, we have notes i will explain later that we have some notes that we don't know in which approach we will reach to the to the dm because probably the it's possible that the maximum of lsdm is not the maximum of dm but in second order it is and that sphere mm -hmm. will uh, represent the DM particle that would be there. So to me, it's it's, it's quite, quite logical that the maximum is a closed approximation to the DM. But the DM particles also assume the same thing. And the maximum, you get the maximum, the distribution of the maximum point. Yeah. And you can see a sphere with any smooth surface. And that would be a very good approximation. Ah, in the, in the surface. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I, I will come back to this, uh, to this, and maybe it, it's more clear. Uh, so we are using the maximum, and uh, another thing that is important about the level set is that we can do perform some operations between the level sets. For instance, this is an analysis of breakage mechanics. So if we have a, a particle that is represented by a level set one, okay, this is 3D and this is the 2D. And we have a fracture surface that is represented by phi two. We can do, for instance, uh, the maximum of phi and uh, minus phi two, and we will obtain the left part, uh, sorry, the right part of the of the initial particle. And if we do uh, a very slightly different operation that is plus phi two, we will obtain the left part. So, uh, what is the idea? Is to explain that with operations like max of the level sets. If I have two level sets, I can, one level set I can break in two, or also, if, for instance, this is something that we will use in sintering, is that at some point, if they are very indented, I consider that two particles becomes one. So what the operation that I will do is, I have the level set of uh, particle three and four, I will perform the, mi the minimum, if the result will Perform in a new particle level set one. So this is some of the ideas that we will <coughs> use in the for the sintering process. But now, now entering in, in detail in the contact detection, that is one of the most critical points when we are talking about uh, non-spherical shapes. The traditional approach, let's say the initial approach. Uh, proposed by Kawamoto in the level set DM was to create uh, different nodes in the surface of the level set. So I will create one of the particles, but at uh, 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 one moment I will create this and I will calculate the level set of the particle two, that is the particle on the right of, of each of the points of the particle on the surface. And the points that has a level set negative, it means that are inside of the, of the particle of the right. And then I choose uh, which one has the highest indentation. One of the points, I don't know if this was related to that, but it's dependent on the nodes of the indentation. You don't know, for instance, here, what will be closer to the DM? If I do the sum of this, or the average, or just this? Because this is not yeah, a sphere, huh? it will be. Yeah, but normally, normally you don't allow for such big indentation. Because if you have this discretization that is so rough, and you already have two nodes inside the indentation, the idealization is really very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, about the, the, the number of, uh, of points, uh, we will show the most of the problems was with the small indentations. Uh, we'll see to, to capture this. So this is the idea, the general idea is to create nodes in the surface and to do uh, one of, of the problems. And I will show a, a picture, a graph showing how big uh, why is computationally costly. But most of the, the main problem is that it will not give directly the maximum indentation. It's mesh dependent. No? Uh, we perform a, a very small analysis, very quick analysis to show I am showing the indentation 
in uh, with the number of nodes. It was made for a density of around 60, but it's very common uh, for a green packing to start the, the century. And um, what we saw is that in the packing of 59, that we need around 40,000 nodes in the surface. And with that, we were around 80% on the indentation occurrence of the theoretical indentation. And if we analyze also the number of contacts, also was around 70 and 80. So to create, for the beginning, for the, if we have higher indentations, it will be, we don't have the same problem as you can see with 40,000 already with, this is at the packings with more density. We are already quite, uh, we can describe quite well. But for the small indentations, it will be a, a problem. No, I, I, I need to have 40,000 uh, nodes for each particle. But, sorry, can you explain a little bit better what you're measuring here? The measuring with respect to what? The, the indentation, uh, I, am, I have a packing of okay. 4,000. Perfect spheres. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and so for spheres, I already have the, this problem. For a small indentation. No? So at that point, we decided to go to uh, another approach that uh, was initially proposed by David just that year, but they use another type of uh, uh, optimization algorithm. Uh, so it's to do an optimization approach. But uh, simply what we are doing is we have the two particles, each described by its each level set. And what we want to do is first to find a point that has level set zero, that means on the surface, but at the same point that it minimizes phi two. That means it's more indented in phi two. So we want to find, for instance, this point. And <clears throat> with the, I will explain about the transition algorithm that we use. Once that we reach this, most of the, uh, because we will perform this for the, for the potential contacts. So it's possible that when you arrive at the solution, this point is outside of, of FIDO2. So then we stop the calculation. But if FIDO2 two is negative, so it's inside of the particle, we go and we will uh, do the second optimization problem that is minimize phi one and with phi two equals zero. That means to find this point. And with, uh, with these two points, we have the, the information to calculate or uh, the indentation, the force, uh, uh, all the information that we need for, for the contact. So uh, explaining about the, the algorithm of optimization, we use Lagrangian multipliers to transform, to reach, using this, we will reach to these three equations, okay? So we need to, to solve this, uh, this nonlinear equation. We use newton raphson method. And <clears throat> what we do is we call this G and H, these two functions. So uh, we will have uh, basically this equation for each contact. I have the Jacobian to calculate the step, uh, because what, what I need is to, to reach what is the, pos the position, the coordinate of the point in, in, the, in the contact. So that's, we will perform uh, several iterations until we have uh, given stop, uh, stop criteria. And uh, uh, <coughs> in this case, I am showing phi, phi one. And if at the end, in conversion, the point is inside phi two, we will do again for the second process. During the contact, you change this point or once you change the image? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And talking about that, in, in, in a given contact, the first uh, the first time, if they are not in contact, I know in the next step they are in contact. So we need, always we need a starting point no, for Newton Rapson. So the first time that it happens, what we do is we have, uh, we create, it's very circumscribed each particle, 
and we, cal we calculate the contact point of these two spheres. This is analytically, you know, geometrically, just based on the position and on the radius of the spheres, we can calculate this contact point. And this we use for starting the neutron absorption search. But for the same contact in the next 10 steps, we use the starting point, the previous solution, because it will be faster to, to converge. <clears throat> and very recently, in the last weeks, we, for some tests, we have some problems with the convergence of the neutron absorption, and we saw that uh, adding this alpha here in the search, it could be, it, it will help to the convergence. At this point, we are using a constant alpha. We saw that it's, uh, uh, that makes sense for a problem, but also we can use another uh, more, uh, another more complex uh, algorithms to change the, the, the value of alpha. Okay, so with that approach, we will be able to calculate the, the coordinates of these two points if the contact exists. And now we can calculate uh, the indentation, the normal, and the curvature. So basically, if we, we will call the points that we found x up 1 and x up 2. So we calculate the phi 2 of x up 1, that is the distance to the, the, from the point on the surface of particle 1 to the, to the surface 2, and the same for the other point. And we, we do a, an average. In the literature, our it's likely some difference for calculation this. Some use just one point, another do an average, the same for the normal. But we see that uh, this is this is numerically this is more uh, uh, stable. So for the normal, we calculate the gradient of each one, and as we need a unit, a unit normal, we divide from the uh, with the normal. Uh, for the curvature. We have this expression, where it's a long expression, but all depends on the values of phi and the first and second derivatives. And with that, we can calculate the, the curvature. In this case, I am showing for the particle one, but a similar equation for the particle two. Then I can calculate the radius of curvature. And with that, we use this formula for the equivalent radius of, uh, of this contact. And this is the, the R EQ is the one that we will use in, in the normal source. Okay, uh, when we just finished to the, the main implementation, we start to perform some validation. Uh, of course, the model, the idea of the model is to non-spherical particles, but we start using spheres, but in the level set context, so calculating the distance of all this. And we start with a packing, in this case, of 400 particles, and we compact here to reach uh, uh, around density 50, at the beginning was 30. And what we compare is the time step, and here is the mean indentation in all the packing. And we see first the dependence on the mesh, this is the number of the cells uh, per, per direction in each particle. And here in the slightly blue is the values of the DM. So we see that with 100 cells, it's, uh, it, it, it's very near from the DM calculation. But it's not enough to do that. We also have to see locally. No, not just the mean value because it could be sometimes hidden. No, if you are if you have the same course, but you can have higher contacts in one region, another is small. So what we do is to do an histogram of the contacts. In the left is the DM, and in the right of level set DM. First with 20 cells, and we saw that the the contacts are, are very very different. So here we can see that here already saw a difference in the mean value, but here we see that no, the difference is higher than that. So we need more cells. And we, when we compare with the 100 cells with the DM, 
we saw that we are much closer, but we, the contacts, some contacts that we lost, and mainly the small contacts in the, here in the left, the very small contacts. This is a ratio of the indentation by the radius. So a very bad, we, we are lost. In order to get that, it will be necessary to, to, to increase the, the mesh. Just to have an idea, this for, for spheres, it, in the DM it was around 30 seconds, and the LSDM was around 370 seconds, where one of, at the beginning, uh, a time around 50 seconds was to create and to save the level set values of all the particles on the grid. So this is a part that is time uh, RAM consuming and time consuming. What, what do you mean by sets? Sorry? What do you mean by sets? Ah, it's the number of, uh, 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 of, um, of elements in each direction, in each particle. So uh, when they say 100 cells, it, it means that each particle has 100 uh, uh, cube uh, nodes. No? Grid, yeah, grid, this is a local grid. Of yeah, local grid. Of, each, of each, yes. So then we started with uh, a kind of non spherical particles. Uh, we start with the ellipsoids, and it's just two ellipsoids and approaching each one uh, with a given uh, displacement. And we calculate the force. And we compare in the literature, there are some values with the finite element method and with other DM codes that consider uh, non-spherical particles. And what we see is that our model is, it obtains the same values of the DM with non-spherical particles using a mean curvature. If we use a curvature, uh, call it the Gaussian curvature, we will be closer to the finite element, but it's proved that it can uh, have some singularities in some points of depending on the shape of the particle. So we decided to use the mean curvature in order to, to be able to calculate at any point of, of, the, of the particle. So uh, almost finishing, the <coughs> what, what we observed is that the, is, a, is a prime minimum method. It, it, um, we can say, that it could be between the, the DM, the traditional DM, and some other methods like phase field, you know, where you have a, a variation of the shape. So we can say that LSDM could be here on, on, on the middle. If that means that it will have uh, more computational costs if we compare with DM, but we see that uh, it, it will be possible to run uh, thousands of particles. But some problems that we still have, we still, because we are in, still in developing phase, is to we have some problems of singularity when we have two perfectly aligned uh, particles. Uh, I mean, if one of the coordinates of, of the both particles are exactly the same, uh, we, uh, our algorithm doesn't uh, found the, didn't find the the, the point. Uh, but if we likely one, for instance, one minus six, it arrives to, to get. So this is something that we are trying. Maybe we will do a second order interpolation. Um, the neutral absent convergence now is working, but this is something that we know that it depends of, uh, on the, if we have very regular shapes, it can be very dependent on the starting point. At this point, we are not, even the LSDM, LSDM is, is able to, to calculate not convex particle. Uh, as we, when we saw the sintering packings, most of the particles are convex. But uh, one of the ideas that we have is, in case of we have no convex particle, what is needed is to change the optimization, optimization algorithm, no? to find, for instance, if I have a non-convex particle, I can have multiple points of contact with another particle. So one of the idea is to start the neutral absent from different points 
of my of my domain. You know? it's just just an idea. And the run consumption because it could be we have very small indentation. I need a, a grid uh, very refined, so it could uh, have impact on the. It could the the one that I show you. I didn't say, but was around one gigabyte of, of, of RAM for for four hundred. Uh, Particle is fixed now in that case, but if we if we continue uh, seeing that this can be a problem, a recently paper uh, proposed no, to to use quark three or three, but the idea is to don't save the your value of the level set in the whole grid, but just to put more nodes closer to the surface because. There is where you you want to be very accurate. So this is something that we, we, we keep in mind. Uh, and the, the future work is we are here in Simne working with the because we don't have a, a tool for 3D plus processing, so we are using Git. And also we are because we just implemented the quaternions in the level set. The end method. So we are trying to validate the, the rotation with the uh, with a finite element analysis performing in Kratos. And then we will be able to run simulation with packing of non-spherical shapes. And the first point with elastic force, as we have already done, but now with non-spherical shapes, and then uh, start uh, the simulations with with simple forces. So thank you to to Sim, to to Miguel Angel for by all the help during this this month and all the people in Sim. And thank you also for for participating of the of the webinar. Please let me know if you need help, any comments, any suggestions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I don't know how you want to to um, uh, to organize this. Uh, the questions uh, you want to divide the questions for you or for your colleague. Maybe maybe it's, uh, it's better that way. I don't know if um, any of uh, the attendants have any questions or, or comments to to Brian. Also, as as Guillermo Casa did, Casas did, I mean, you can uh, ask questions uh, during the presentation. There is no problem. Yeah. Here, here we have one question. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, uh, or, or perhaps a comment. Um, I, I would like to see a relationship between the minimum uh, discretization size and the maximum indentation that you expect in the problem. I think these two concepts are, are linked. So if I expect to have a maximum indentation of whatever size, mm -hmm. this size has to be related to my discretization yeah. of the Yeah. I would like to see the the analysis of this, you know, uh, how, how you did it, because then this is linked to the curvature calculation, and if you're using something like Hertz model, you need to have this information, you know. Yeah. It, it can help, because maybe you can have a regime where you're above the, a certain limit, and it's easy, and up below is not so easy, uh, things like that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, we do a road calculation just to have an idea, but it's better to put in the paper, because it's related, not directly. Yeah, it should, it should be related. Yes. If, if you have a very, very, imagine that an indentation is bigger than your discretization size. It doesn't make sense. Because yeah. then all those details are crushed. Yeah. They shouldn't be crushed, so they shouldn't matter. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Any more comments? Well, maybe, maybe when you're comparing the two histograms, uh, it may also be interesting to think about the, the, the subtracting the two histograms and, ah, and yeah. looking at the, the norm of the error. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe the maybe the squared is natural because it's related to the energy, the elastic energy. You can relate the elastic energy uh, to the you can normalize the error squared by the elastic oh. energy, the total elastic energy. And perhaps ah, that it's true. Makes sense. Yeah, we will write. Thank you.
Do you have a question? Yeah, in the chat. Uh, all the step size in the Newton Raphson has been chosen. Uh, and, uh, here we use the step size in the <clears throat> alpha. Ah, okay. We started with alpha one. Uh, well, uh, we at the beginning we don't have the we didn't have the, the alpha, uh, but then we saw we see some. Uh, we perform some calculations in our in the densities that we have that is very likely to have in sintering. So now I think that is around 0 0.1. But uh, this is something that is still open because I think that at some point we have to to change for for uh, to allow to the alpha uh, change from one and reducing and and based on a on a convergence criteria. This will be more. Uh, Accurate, yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no more comments, we can move to the next speaker, maybe. Yeah. Sure. And thank you, Brian, for the presentation. Okay. Do you see my Yes. Okay now. Yes, seems to. Okay. I don't know what's happening. I mean, the first time that I see this weird behavior, honestly. But it seems that now it's okay or not. <laughs> I think it's, I should do the window.
You see? Yeah, that is the one. Why? This one is okay. Good. Yeah, it's enough. So I think I'll just look at this. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you can hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, someone? Yeah, yeah. Alejandro, can, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you, but you can cannot hear us. I'm not hearing ah. you. <laughs> can you hear us? Yep. Yes. So I'll try one last time. If not, like like this, it should be fine. But uh, well, I mean, okay. <clears throat> one last time. So, I guess you can see now. Yes. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So, hola, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity for uh, letting me uh, share my uh, research work on X-ray nanotomography investigation of ceramic powder sintering. As already mentioned, and as some of you here already might know, I'm Atreya Venkatesh, working for the CNRS in Grenoble, France, in the context of Matigram. It's a Marie Curie innovative training network with a host of collaboration with different research institutions and industrial partners. And uh, as I don't know if, if uh, Brian has already mentioned the earlier speaker, uh, he and I, we are both involved in one of these projects concerned with sintering in general. And as you are well aware of by now, Brian does uh, simulations while I mainly deal with experimentations and quantitative image analysis so i did not uh, i mean as i know that most of you here deal with simulations too i did not want to bore you all so i let brian do the maximum number of talking maximum time of uh, talking rather so the idea here is to just quickly run through and give an overview of sorts of what i've been doing and uh, point out a few things that i think would uh, generate some interest in you so the objectives of my research work are, are to first obtain complete 3D nanotomography images of sintered ceramic systems at high temperatures, then to go a step further and perform an in-situ analysis. That is to capture sintering in real time. And while doing so, providing quantitative insights throughout the entire sintering cycle. Now, to put things in perspective, Although Brian has already talked about it, and since I already had this in my slides, uh, there is no other way, but please uh, pardon me for going over it again. So sintering, as you would know, is a process wherein a powder or a powder compact, when subject to just thermal energy, is transformed into a bulk material of controlled density. Now, as a result of this, the powder uh, po compact not only densifies, but is also accompanied by an an increase in the size of the individual grains. So the complete process is divided into three overlapping stages, as you can see here, which is characterized by initially a formation of so-called necks in between particles, then over time densification, and finally grain growth. Now quickly to touch upon why the chosen material of interest here is ceramics. The, the principal reason being, unlike say metallic powders here, the typical size of ceramic particles is around one micrometer or less. That is at the resolution limit of microtomography that you find in the, in the laboratories. Also complex and irregular shapes of ceramic particles, the tendency to form agglomerates, etc., point to the fact that we would in nanotomography to explore say ceramic sintering phenomena at the particle length scale. That is where the synchrotron tomography comes into the picture. Now, 
uh, focusing on the main objective of my research work, that is investigation of ceramic powder sintering. This is the process outline that we follow. With the chosen ceramic powders, in our case, it's alumina powders, we make powder compacts in a dye press. We then perform sintering in a dilatometry setup. We then break these sintered samples into tiny fragments and take them to the synchrotron for a post-mortem analysis. Now, in this regard, we take advantage of the outstanding features of uh, the upgraded synchrotron at the ESRF in Grenoble, France, uh, to perform nanoimaging. Synchrotron, as you would know, is a powerful source of X-rays, um, with the one at the ESRF being the world's uh, brightest X-ray source. Uh, the highly current nanofocus beam here with high energy, particularly at this ID16V beam line, enables us to study very small samples with resolutions in nanometers. Now, quickly to explain the principle behind all these in brief, uh, rather than convention, I'm, I'm assuming that you would be familiar with uh, the tomography principle in general, the conventional tomography, which uses the ability of X-rays, say, to penetrate into objects and give us, offer us 3D information. Rather than the conventional tomography, in this case here, we, you, we use a slightly tweaked phase sensitive nano tomography approach. The experimental setup looks like this. Uh, a four distance formula is used. Now, the idea is to move the samples relative to the focal plane. Now, so the distance, that is the distance D1, while keeping the detector fixed, that is D1 plus D2 remains fixed. So bottom line, uh, the idea is actually to get different geomet uh, magnification factors by moving these samples relative to the focal plane. So four sample to focus distances are used. And at each distances, a complete tomographic scan is then performed at a super brilliant resolution of say 25 nanometer. Now the recorded images say at D11, D12, D13 and D14 are then aligned and magnified according to the first distance image. And this four distance image set is then used at each projection angle to retrieve the faces. That is to reconstruct the face shifts at each angle to obtain so-called face maps. The retrieve face maps are then fed into the tomographic reconstruction software, which then gives us this 3D distribution of the sample, which would look like this. So this very principle is used at the ID16B beamline where we have performed our nano imaging. As I said earlier, uh, we break the sintered samples into tiny fragments, extremely tiny to the order of say 100 micrometer in diameter like this and around two millimeter in height. These tiny samples are then placed on these small rotation stages, sensitive rotation stage here and the nano holotomography experiments are then performed. Now shifting our focus to some of the results of uh, post-mortem analysis here. Uh, here is a cross section of one of, a crop section of one of the sections of a 3D alumina with an initial particle size of 1.5 micrometer and initial relative density of 60%. It's been sintered at 1,500 degrees for one hour, 10 hours and 30 hours respectively. The grains are in gray while the pores are in black. So just by looking at them globally, we can say that there is some rapid interparticle neck growth in the initial stages, followed by some considerable densification later on, wherein the density reaches around 91% after 30 hours of sintering. So thus signaling intermediate stage of sintering. So as you can already see, the segmentation of grains here look relatively easier, at least in the initial stages of sintering. So we have concentrated on the quantitative analysis of the grains rather than the pores. So for the segmentation of grains, uh, this is the process outline that we follow. I won't be delving into details, uh, but we use an improved watershed algorithm to get these 3D segmented versions from these reconstructed samples. And then with regard to quantitative analysis, we do a lot of uh, sintering related parameters. We plot, we analyze, and we compare them. But in this case, I will just show you one such example. This is a scatter plot here. We fit different ellipsoid shapes onto our segmented grains, and then we plot sphericities versus equivalent diameters. 
Now this scatter plot is for the original segmented grain, uh, which is around 1.5 micrometer in diameter with all the distributions of all the likely shapes concentrated around 1.5 micrometer. Now with increase in the center time, the distribution moves to the right. Now this is how it looks after one hour of sintering. Also please note some of the snapshots of the segmented results here on the right. And the scatter plots then looks like this after 10 hours and finally like this after 30 hours of sintering, thus capturing the trend of sintering. Also, if you could notice the number of grains are reducing also over time. Uh, some of the outliers here correspond to some faulty segmentation like this because at this density after 30 hours, the watershed algorithm literally fails to capture and uh, figure out the grains correctly. So it results in merging or merging of grains in most cases. Now, we have also done a post-mortem analysis on a much smaller alumina with an initial particle size of 0 0.7 micrometer, which means sintering happens much faster here than the previous case of 1.5 micrometer. And you can clearly see a clear transition from intermediate to say final stage of sintering with the density reaching around 94% after just 10 hours of sintering here. So over time, increase in grain size, decrease in grain numbers, isolated pores, etc. And also, if you could notice, segmentation of grains here is impossible because your eye cannot, so your softwares cannot do as well. So what we have done is we have concentrated mostly on the pores, the quantitative analysis on pores rather than the grains. And Regarding the segmentation of pores, this here is one of the evolution of say closed porosity over time. In this case, the value of closed porosity tries to catch up with the total porosity at final stages of sintering. Again, in this case, we have plotted, analyzed and compared different such sintering parameters. Now, what I would like to show you is some comparison here between 1.5 and 0.7 micrometer. This here is a pore size distribution by granulometry. The distribution uh, of volume versus pore diameter, the, dis the distribution moves downwards, signaling that the densification is happening and the there is a reduction in the pore volume. Also giving us a mean pore size, mean representative pore size, let's say, at different stages of sintering. In particular, at for alumina with 0 0.7 micrometer, after 10 hours of sintering, we see some sort of pore coalescence happening here after 10 hours of sintering. So that slightly increases its mean pore size. Now, in order to uh, measure, let's say, pore closure in, in, a, in a more correct way, we have come up with this connectivity index, which is a ratio of largest pore volume to the total pore volume. And so when you, when you compare 1.5 and 0.7, uh, well, let's say connectivity index is, first of all, maximum when all the pores are open in the initial stage of sintering and it's already close to zero when all the pores are when all the pores are closed so in the case of 0 0.7 micrometer above 85 percent we see we see a drop in the connectivity index which clearly signifies a transition from open porosity to closed porosity and in case of 1.5 micrometer we have not yet reached that stage even after 30 hours of sintering Sorry, but, how do you define the connected pore it just it has one neighbor Connected what? What what defines a connected pore? Connected pore is the connected pore. It's an open pore, so it is so continuous. At least one other pore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A closed pore is one which is not Has surrounded by anything. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just a few examples of what we can do, but we have done a lot of other parameters as well. And moving on, taking. Us taking it to the next level, let's say, we have recently successfully managed to do some in-situ uh, nanotomography investigation of ceramic powder sintering. And in this regard, we have developed and built this uh, very compact high temperature furnace, which is capable of going up to 1,500 degrees, uh, thanks to its platinum resistor, which provides a stable and homogeneous temperature, let's say, inside the furnace. Also to be noted is an efficient cooling system around the furnace, which is capable of maintaining the temperature outside, just outside the furnace to less than 25 degrees, in spite of the furnace being at 1,500 degrees. So that fits the synchrotron conditions. And therefore you can directly 
perform the in situ experiments directly inside the synchrotron hutch. And followed by this is how the investigation will happen next. Again, we use a phase contrast nano holotomography technique using a four distance method, as I described earlier, at the ID 16B beam line of the ESRF. And so once reconstructed, let's say, I mean, it's, it's not very, it's not very accurate. So we tend to lose some, I mean, the imaging is not so accurate. So we tend to lose some of the, the location of uh, the particles. So the, the particle tracking is very difficult. So we use some scripts in a, in a software called SPAM for some image correlation. For example, this is after a point uh, of uh, centering. This is, let's say, the original. When we compare, they are not in the same location. So what we do is we first perform an image correlation by eye. And then we perform a non-rigid registration between these set of images to more or less give us an ability to track the same particles later on. So right now, currently, we are in the process of uh, visualizing the displacement fields that come from these results. And now uh, moving on to some some of the, the, the tracking of, let's say, local particles at different stages of centering. In this particular example here, you see a clear interparticle neck growth happening over time. This is for alumina with 1.5 micrometer. And in this case, down here, you see some densification coupled with some preliminary cushioning of rains as well. If you look closely, the, the big guys are starting to uh, or tend to eat all of the small guys and become bigger. And also, there is this uh, funny guy in, in uh, alumina 0.7 micrometer who tends to lose his uh, hands and legs after a point of time as a result of uh, some reduction in the pore volume. So, Currently, we are in the process of quantitatively analyzing all these images and to derive some interesting novel information on centering and validating them. So to sum it up, we have, uh, thanks to the phase contrast nanoholotomography technique at the ESRF and the resulting super high resolution of 25 nanometer, we have been able to successfully obtain complete 3D nanotomography images for centered ceramic systems thereby retrieving uh, information on the evolution of ceramic sintering at the particle length scale. And uh, also currently we are, uh, we are trying to generate some novel information on ceramic sintering thanks to our in-situ analysis. And finally, as, as Brian already mentioned, uh, well, as a part of Matrigram research, we are supposed to do some secondments outside our research institutions, and that's why I'm here at Simne. Um, I'm going on with my in-situ analysis while I work here. Uh, and in the meanwhile, I'm also in touch with some of the researchers here to get their inputs on how to post-process and visualize my data using your own uh, Git software or any other software. And uh, in the meantime, we're also, Brian and I, we're also doing some collaboration here. Um, and we are in the sense we are checking if how close or rather how far our simulation and experiment uh, results are actually. And additionally, one thing I did, which I did not mention in the presentation is that we have added different volume fractions of uh, bigger alumina particles here and observed them in situ while centering them. So the, the, the primary interest here is the effect of such large inclusions on say intensification and grain growth phenomena, both globally and locally as well. So yeah, that, that aside, I think that brings us to the end of this presentation. But that aside, we are taking some time to explore Barcelona now and time for some <laughs> rejuvenation. <laughs> and uh, we are trying to get to the, know, know the people here and while well, relishing some tapas as well. And so, yeah, it's been it's been a nice journey. So thank you. Looking forward to the rest of my days here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope that you will have a, a really good time here in Barcelona. Yeah. Uh, How do I do that? I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, but it will be.
you okay. turn, turn on the volume there from the laptop and you know, yeah. then you mute it. Yeah. Can you talk, Alejandro? Please. Yes. Uh, no, no. Now you will work. Alejandro? Yes. Yes. Ah, we can hear you now. Ah, okay. Ah, you are okay. not listening. Now you are hearing to myself. I have one question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, whoever has the question, because I don't. Okay. My question is: um, You said about some tools that you are using, like the spam software, yeah. to analyze the data you have. But it seems like you are developing your own tools also yeah. to get new data that the software is not providing. Yeah. Uh, are these able? These these tools available for the rest? I mean. Can we use them eventually? Eventually, maybe. Eventually, maybe. But right now, we are developing plugins and some codes in Python in in, in CMAP. But eventually, I think uh, can if it works. Okay. <laughs> I have one question. So, uh, why do you choose uh, Alumina systems? Okay. So that's the first step because uh, ceramic particles are usually less than one micrometer, right? The ones we use are in nanometers, but you have to find a way to balance your resolution limit and your particle size. So it was extremely difficult to get, let's say, I mean, we, we tried with zinc oxide first, silk, silicon carbide, mm -hmm. but none of the, the, the particle size were able to be detected by the resolution at the synchrotron because the, the least it can do is 25 nanometer, which is very good. And then we, we found out this alumina, which was around 1 micrometer, 1.5 micrometer. And it's also more or less spherical in shape. So and that's one of the reasons. Yes, because the problem is yeah. the temperature of sintering. It's very, very high. Yeah, yeah. so you, you need to balance all this uh, out. Yeah, yeah. Decrease uh, this temperature with uh, yeah. the system. So the temp silica, silica does. Do no, we tried with silica and then I, I broke some of my furnaces because it reacts and gives out some some ah, gases, okay. so it does not work with some the normal resistors. So okay. <laughs> I broke two furnaces and then realized we <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because with silica glass you can sit yeah. there at yeah. lower temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your resolution depends on the on temperature. Yeah, yeah. If you use high temperature, you yeah. Know, so there are many constraints. Temperature, particle size, resolution. So we are trying to balance it all. Yeah. Okay. Also, the, if you look at the, the hours of sintering, because 30 hours of sintering is not yeah. possible in synchrotron. The maximum we get is like two days. So you have to play with a lot of constraints. Okay. Any more questions, comments? What kind of simulations do you want to perform? How would you like to see perform? Well, he, he, he is doing the, the simulations. Okay, Ryan. So, <laughs> like, like, what could you do with your. Well, so the thing is, we are, I have given him some of my initial parameters. Let's say, for example, particle size, the number of particles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and he's trying to develop, uh, simulate, mm -hmm. trying to see how far or how close we are right now. So we have been doing that since a few days now. First, we will check the global parameters, like how it's evolving the density and the mean grain size with time, and then we will. The idea is to look for a local and to see how a specific contact uh, evolves with time and to see the difference between both. But are you putting a lot of physics into the model? I mean, are you melting the material? Or... Uh, no, because it's happened before the melting. Okay. Well, how do you... Well, I guess there are some models. I just don't know enough about this. But... Yeah, basically, there is an uh, expression for the normal force between to the particles that will it depends on the energy surface uh, and 
the radial curvature, it will shrink. So we have uh, one expression for that. Yeah. And also in the future, we would like to, because the tray observes when he has the constraints in train, that uh, the, the big particles are, are increasing. So we would like to see if with DM we will able to, because it, it was not expected. It, it, it was expected that this particle just, Stays. it will uh, slow down the syndrome, but they stay at the same size. Okay, so the big guy is just getting bigger. And bigger. So what's the physical principle? So what's happening really to the small particles? How are they getting sucked up by the bigger ones? Because they must transfer between the one because they want to reduce the energy surface, so they want to become like coalescents. Like, are they liquid or like a liquid, like a drop? Or not? No. It just happens no. through solids. Through solids. Yeah. 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 Yeah.